All right. So good evening to everyone. And we are about to uh, look at the Haftarah or Vayetze, Vayetze. Um, and this, it's found in the Eitz Chaim Chumash on page 189. It is the last few verses of Hosea, Hosea uh, chapter 12, and then chapter 13, and then the beginning of chapter 14. So it goes on for, for a bunch. Um, Hosea, have we, I don't, we haven't had him, I, I think, until now yet as one of the authors of uh, Haftarah. Hosea is one of the 12 uh, prophets, often called in English minor prophets, the minor meaning literally smaller, right? Not, not, not important, but they're smaller books and therefore they were all wrapped up together. The Talmud says, why are they all put into one book? Because they're too small on their own and they were afraid that uh, if each one was its own book, its own scroll, that they would disappear. That you know they would just you know fall out of people's pockets. And then and then uh, you know some of these um, next week we'll have Ovadia, I think, and and that's one chapter. So even though Hosea has fourteen chapters, um, fourteen chapters is not you know sixty-five chapters like uh, like uh, Isaiah or something like that. Anyway, so so the twelve he uh, in our tradition he is the first of the twelve, and uh, it's not necessarily because he's the earliest, although he is very early. But uh, um, um, somehow or other, the order got developed the way it was, and he is when you open up Trey Asar the twelve, he's the first prophet and the first book that you encounter. He lived around the same time as first Isaiah, sometime in the middle of the eighth century BCE. Uh, <coughs> there were two Jewish kingdoms. Can you imagine? Imagine, you know, now, now we, you know, we, we just basically struggle with one. But back in those days, there were, there were two, um, the Northern Kingdom and the Southern Kingdom. The Northern Kingdom was the 10 tribes. Eventually they get exiled um, a little bit after Hosea's time uh, at the end of the 12th, of the eighth century BCE. Um, but, uh, um, you know, they're in, in many ways a, a larger entity than the Southern Kingdom. The Southern Kingdom is called Judea. It's mostly Judah and Benjamin gets swallowed up by Judah. And, and uh, we have priests and Levites on, in the north and in the south. Um, but uh, um, Hosea is up in the north. And Hosea is usually not very happy with what he sees in the north. Yeshayahu, Isaiah, is in the south. So they were, like, like I say, pretty much contemporaries. Um, and uh, Hosea is in the northern kingdom. So... Um, we're going to start with our Haftarah. Um, just, oh, just real quick, real quick, quick summary for, uh, of what the Torah reading is. The Torah reading is Vayetze. Uh, Jacob runs away from uh, Esau, Esav, who's trying to uh, get him or wants to bide his time and then eventually get him uh, after his father dies, maybe, uh, because he wants to get revenge for Jacob getting the, the blessing. Um, and uh, he runs away. The uh, beginning of the Torah reading has this amazing uh, uh, vision that he has, a dream vision of the ladder going from earth to heaven. Then we have his waking up and, and responding to that vision. Then he meets the love of his life, Rachel, at the well, you know, a biblical motif. And um, he goes to live with his uncle, Lavan, Lavan is the brother of his mother, Rivka, uh, and that, that's where he was supposed to end up. Um, that was Rivka's uh, uh, plan. And then he encounters somebody who's sneakier than he is and who uh, um, you know, has uh, all kinds of uh, um, you know, devious schemes that he, uh, that he engages in. And he thinks he's gonna marry Rachel. He gets tricked by Lavan. He marries Le Leia instead. Uh, um, in you know whole 
how that happens is a whole discussion in itself. Then he, but he wants Rachel, so he, therefore he has to work for Rachel for another seven years. Um, altogether, he, he lives with Lavan for about 20 years. Um, and he has both Rachel, his beloved, and Leah, his first wife in, by, by chronology, um, as, as wives. And there's a sibling rivalry between Leah and Rachel. Leah doesn't appreciate the fact that uh, even though she's married to Jacob, Jacob really, uh, his heart is with Rachel. Um, and we have this ongoing story, uh, it's a pretty sad story, um, although the results are important because the results are that each of the matriarchs and their maidservants um, have children. Um, Leah is very fruitful. She ends up having six boys and a girl. Um, and she has a maidservant uh, that has another two boys. And Rachel is barren, again, a biblical motif. And uh, she's miserable about it. She gives her maidservant to Jacob. He gets two more sons that way. So that makes altogether 10 sons. And then finally, in this week's Torah reading, uh, she has um, uh, Joseph. Um, Rachel is finally uh, able to have a, a son. And then they, uh, Jacob decides it's time to get out of here. And he runs away from Lavan because Lavan is, is uh, he realizes that Lavan is not honest, an honest broker. And uh, his wives also say, we can't stand our father. He's a miserable so-and-so. So let's all get out of here. And then Lavan runs after him, he finds out that, the, that uh, Jacob has hightailed it out of there. He catches up with him. Um, there's a dramatic encounter there. And uh, um, finally, they uh, set up a, a, a monument that's a peace treaty between them. And uh, then Jacob keeps on moving on. And there's some small other details. There are many details in the Torah reading, but that's enough for now. So um, that's the Torah reading. And now we're going to keep our eyes out um, as we read the Haftarah and see what uh, is the connection or what are the connections that we can make uh, to the Torah reading. So chapter 12 of, Hos of Hosea, beginning with verse 13. And uh, it's in 189 in our Eitz Chaim Chumash. Invitation. Anybody going to uh, read for us today? Go in once. Go in twice. Somebody's got to do this. I'm very stubborn about this. I'm not reading. I can uh, read again. Thank you, Sarita. <laughs> I read last week. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. All right. I'll read. <clears throat> Then Jacob had to flee to the land of Aram. There Israel served for a wife. For a wife, he had to guard sheep. Okay, do we have any connection with our Torah reading? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so this is like pretty explicit. Um, we have uh, Jacob is his name. And then in the next phrase, we have Yisrael, but that's a spoiler alert. That's not going to happen. Jacob is not going to get the name Yisrael till next week. But by the time Hosea is around, this is a given, right? That we exchange these names. Sometimes we call them Jacob. Sometimes we call them Israel. Um, <coughs> and of course, um, Israel is often used as the name for the Northern Kingdom. Right? We'll see that, that uh, Hosea uses another name as well in, in a couple of verses, but uh, the name Israel, as opposed to Judah, who was the dominant tribe in the south, Israel is called the, is is often the name of the of the northern king. Okay, so let's read just this section here till the end of uh, chapter twelve, and then let's let's think about it a little bit more. But we see that there's an absolutely clear connection. Okay. But when the Lord brought Israel up from Egypt, it was through a prophet. Through a prophet, they were guarded. Ephraim gave bitter offense, and his Lord cast his crimes upon him and requited him for his mockery. Okay, end of the chapter. 
So we've got a little bit of a, of a abrupt kind of back and forth and back and forth. So what we have here is Hosea going all the way back to ancient history, to the very beginnings of the people, um, when the people were really just an individual man named Jacob. Israel wasn't a big gigantic set of, you know, coalition of, of tribes and, and a kingdom. It was just this one guy named Israel. And uh, um, he goes through, in, in three verses, he goes through like a, a, um, a thousand years of history. First verse is Jacob. Second verse is Exodus from Egypt, which is much later, right? And then the third verse is Ephraim, which is his name for the Northern Kingdom. Mm. And, and he's in his own, is in his own time already. Um, and, and he's angry at Ephraim for not being loyal to God, right? So in three verses, he's jumped through centuries and centuries from the individual patriarch to the birth of the nation, to coin a phrase, and then um, to the present day situation where he is, okay? so. When we look at, the, at, at that movement, now let's go back and see. So how is he framing what happened with Jacob? And then, uh, you know, he then, then that next step and then that next step. How, how does he see that flow? Well, I, can I just clarify? So the, the, the verse 14, is that referring to after? Jacob had died. Yeah, verse 14 is, right, that's is, after he died. Story, is the story of the Exodus from Egypt. Right. And so, so people, Jacob, Moses, right. Moses is it, the, the, the prophet here is Moses. And they remember, that. he remembers to bring his, his body back to Israel, right? No, I don't think that that's what it is. Um, through a prophet, they, Israel, were guarded. In other words, Moses took care, just like Jacob took care of the sheep. In the, in the first oh. verse. So the prophet took care of Israel in the oh, second. So, okay, so it's, it's, not, it's not specifically Jacob, it's the people Israel. Right, that's the shift, okay. right? That's, how, that's the flipping from one, not just time-wise, but then also what time has done. Time has taken this one man and turned it into a people. We have something a little bit similar when we have it, it we, we quote it in the Haggadah, but it's the first fruits prayer. And we start, we come to the, this is God says, when you get to the land of Israel and then everybody's gonna have their own little homestead and you're gonna have uh, your first fruits and you wanna thank God that you have a wonderful harvest, the first fruits go to God. What do you do? You come to the temple, you come to the shrine, whatever that will be, the place that God will choose. And you then <laughs> say a prayer of thanks. And how do you say the prayer of thanks? You start by saying, my patriarch was a wandering Aramean, oh, right. Yeah. right? So you start with that, that, like what we're doing, like what the Torah actually does. Genesis starts with these individuals. Then when we get to Exodus, we're all of a sudden this, this nation, right? And then that's what we say in that, in that prayer as well. And then we became a great nation and then we had to get, it, get taken out of Egypt. And then we would come here and here I am now and I'm so, Grateful to you, God, for, uh, uh, for all that you've done, right? So we do that again, a similar kind of three-step jumping from, you know, the original patriarchal period setting us up, then the national period, specifically again with Egypt, being born as a nation and being dependent on God's uh, um, redemption. And then finally getting here, wherever here is, right? So that, and that's part of the, of the, you know, the problem for Hosea, we're in a broken here, right? In the, in the first fruits uh, prayer, God is imagining you'll come to the land of Israel, everything will be wonderful, you'll be so happy, you'll come to this special center for, you know, for serving me, you'll say thank you, you'll bring your first fruits, it'll all be great. Um, here, Hosea, Hosea is saying, so where is the great? Where is the wonderful? You know, so he has two, two steps that he describes according to the way they were and what, and what we should be learning from those two steps. And then we've got the uh, disappointing, to put it mildly, 
uh, reality of today, that instead of it being, oh, and you are so happy and to be God's children and, and so on. So what's the first part again? The first part, there's a bunch of um, wordplay and there's also kind of parallel uh, uh, examples. The first example is Jacob runs away, right? So we get that, that, and this is the way our Torah reading begins. He's a refugee He's, or a fugitive, right? It's got that same root in there. Um, he, and he's, he's in trouble. He's vulnerable. He's in danger, right? Um, and then he finds some place to, of shelter and he finds a woman that uh, he loves, right? And he's willing to work for her, right? So, and there Israel worked for this woman, right? Vaya avod, right? He, he slaved, he worked, he labored, he served also. All of those words are all good, right? Uve isha shamar. And for a woman or a wife, he guarded. And then we have now fast forward centuries and centuries. And look at this. God appoints a prophet to take us out of, to take Israel, who has now become this massive nation, right? Out of trouble, uh, right? And, and, and the people are watched over. They're guarded by, 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 the, by the Navi. So we have two images of faithful guardianship. Um, I want to uh, point out, I think, so you have Shamar and Nishmar, active in the first verse, Jacob guarded, and it doesn't say the sheep, that's, we, you know, we have to add that as an assumption. And in the second one, Jacob is the one who is guarded. Jacob Israel is guarded, right? So just like Jacob was a shepherd, and guarded the sheep. God appoints shepherds to guard us. We are God's sheep, right? What do we say? We say, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, right? So we are, we are God's flock. So um, we have that, that kind of parallelism. But there's another thing I think that, that we, we might have, uh, um, look at. So there's, it's not the most usual interpretation, but it's out there. Uvi Isha Shamar. It says you have twice. By Avod Yisrael Isha, Israel served for a wife. And that's missing from the English. U Isha Shamar. Right? And for a wife, he guarded. So let's go back to our Torah reading. How many wives did Jacob actually have? Two, right? So then maybe that's also part of what's here, right? Maybe the first wife and the second wife mentioned in that first verse is not Rachel only, but maybe it is an allusion to what actually happened to him. He thought he was working for Rachel, right? That's the first part of the verse. He worked for a wife, but then he got a different wife, right? And then what did he have to do? Uvi Isha Nishmar, uh, Shamar. And then he had to, and here instead of, I would suggest instead of the word guard, well, you can use the word guard, he waited. He had to bide his time. Right. We have it, for instance, later when, um, when uh, Joseph has his dreams and he tells his dreams to his, to his father, Jacob, and to his brothers. His brothers are angry and terrible. You know, it's all awful. And it says, V'yakov shamar et hadavar. And Jacob guarded the matter. Right? In other words, he held it in to himself and he, and he sort of like kept it to himself to see what was going to happen. So the idea being that he, he, had to, he had to wait it out. He had to then say, you know what? 
I didn't get the, the wife that I wanted. I want this other wife and I'm going to, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, still, you know, uh, stand guard. I'm still going to be faithful to trying to get the wife that I want. Did he, um, did he marry Rachel right away though? And then just agreed to keep working or did he actually what, wait this? It, that, so that's a little, a little vague. Um, love on, he says to him, he says, what the heck did you do to me? You know, he, he wakes up the next yeah. morning. So, so he says to Lovan, you know, that's, this is not right. And then Lovan says, wait out these seven and then I'll, I'll give you Rachel. So the question is, what is seven what? Seven days of the wedding feast or seven more years and then you get Rachel? So the, the, it's pretty, it seems pretty clear that he, he gets Rachel right away, but then he owes then he still owes another seven owes, years. And, and instead of just running away, oh, now I got my wife. You know, so he has to, he has to keep his promise. Okay. So he, has, you know, so he has to actually fulfill that, that sentence that he was, you know, that he got himself into um, out of, so then it's not so much just that he's loyal to his wife, he's loyal to his obligation, right? He's, he's loyal to his promise. And then God is loyally taking the Israelites out of Egypt and taking care of them by, by appointing a prophet to be their guard and their, and, and their guide and their guard and, uh, and, and their leader. And then verse 15. Right? So the, the translation, one more time. Let's do 15. Ephraim. Uh, gave uh, gave bitter offense, and his lord cast his crimes upon him and requited him for his mockery. Okay, so this is like now, like the tone of voice is very different, right? And the the first word is um, again not quite um, uh, as as clear as it could be in the English, right? The it says is Ephraim tamrurim. Tamrurim means bitterness, right? From the word like maror, mm. right? Mar, maror, um, bitters. Um, but the word hichis comes from the word anger, rage. So a, a literal translation would be that Ephraim has enraged me so bitterly. Right? It's, 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 you know, so this is like, I am really, really, really ticked off. So this is, this is, you know, this is not right. Um, does that have any echo in our Torah reading? Is Ephraim Northern Israel, like the Northern Kingdom? Yes. Okay. I mean, that's how Jacob feels toward Laban. <laughs> right, right. That when it, this is injustice, you're treating me completely wrong. You know, you're you're being completely, uh, uh, you know, you're you're paying you're paying me, you know, bad for good, right? I've been and and we're in, you know, we, this is chapter twelve, verse 13, 14, 15. Before that, there's also this whole discussion about you are so conniving, you are so dishonest, and using the very same word that mirma that comes from the Jacob, Esav, and Lavan stories and accusing you know Ephraim of being totally you know dishonest and and uh, uh, double dealing so so that's you know sort of th this ironic replay here but do I deserve to be treated this way says God you know come on you know what have I done if not if not you know been been uh, you know you know terrifically uh, uh, solicitous for you right? So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna let this go. The difference between Jacob vis-a-vis -vis Lavan and God vis-a-vis -vis Ephraim is God has power. Right? Jacob had no power. Right? Jacob, in order to survive, had to be maybe devious and eventually has to run away from Lavan without telling him, because otherwise Lavan would stop him. But here God is saying, no, 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 but I'm, you know, I'm watching and I'm not gonna let this pass. Right? 
So um, I, as the master, am going to uh, make sure that you are going to pay for this. Okay. And we continue. Chapter 13. 13. When Ephraim spoke piety, he was exalted in Israel, but he incurred guilt through Baal, and so he died. And now they go on sinning. They have made them molten images, idols by their skill from their silver, wholly the work of craftsmen. Yet for these, they appoint men to sacrifice. They are wont to kiss calves. Assuredly, they shall be like morning clouds, like dew so early gone, like chaff whirled away from the threshing floor and like smoke from a lattice. Only I, the Lord, have been your God ever since the land of Egypt. You have never known a true God but me. You have never had a helper other than me. I looked after you in the desert in a thirsty land. When they grazed, they were sated. When they were sated, they grew haughty. And so they forgot me. So I am become like a lion to them, like a leopard I lurk on the way, like a bear robbed of her young, I attack them and rip open the casing of their hearts. I will devour them there like a lion. The beasts of the field shall mangle them. Okay, so let's, let's uh, stop here. It's gonna continue in, in a similar vein, but strong stuff, yeah. right? This is, this is the kind of prophetic you know, outrage that's given a, you know, very po poetic uh, uh, expression, but th there's no, there's no, what, you know, if you can't understand this phrase or that phrase, you get the point. The point is, well, what's the point? What is Hosea telling Ephraim? What is he telling the Northern Kingdom? They are creating okay. idols. Yeah, What's it right? seems to be a reminder of the um, the flight from Egypt, the, the journey to the promised land where everything they had handed to them and the, the current betrayal, I guess. Um, and what's going to be the result of that betrayal? Uh, God will have them destroyed, it sounds like. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Right. Death, yeah. death and yeah. destruction. Right? This no, is, no two ways is this before... It. Is this before, before the Northern Kingdom fell? Before the death and the destruction. Right. Yeah. This is a prophecy of the end of, of uh, this society, right? That you guys are not going to be able to last because you are enraging God and you think that you've got it all figured out and it's not, it cannot be this way. Right. So, um, and the kissing when, calves are the Jeroboam. Uh, Idols, uh, the, right? And yes, those are the, the 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 absolutely you know the national you know idol uh, uh, you know uh, icons, so to speak, and you know <coughs> most probably plenty of other idols running around, right? In in uh, in a more individual or local situation, but yeah. So this this idea of you could be worshiping me. Once upon a time, you did worship me. And when you did worship me, you prospered, right? That's the beginning of this, right? But then, no, you decided to go to Baal. You decided to, you know, exchange me for other gods. And then you decided to go into the idol industry, right? You decided to, this is, this is what we want to do. Let's, let's make a whole you know, manufacturing of idols and let's make put together an elite of people that can then, you know, do the rituals for the idols um, and, and uh, substitute, um, you know, that for, for, for worshiping uh, God. So Any, just, yeah, go ahead, so I'm just thinking that, you know, so, you know, of course, when they, uh, when, on their journey, <laughs> they also made an idol, a calf, a golden calf, Right. Um, and because they were guarded by Moses, Moses pleaded with God to forgive them and God forgave them. Moses isn't here now. Right. And of um, course they destroyed the golden calf, right? Or right. Moses destroyed the golden calf, you know, for them. Right. But, but you know, this is the whole point. But what, what uh, Jen was saying before, they have these calves now. They've sort of reinstituted 
I mean, some biblical scholars read it the opposite way. True way. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say they that. Read the calf story as a polemic against the the uh, idols that they had in the northern kingdom. You know, the other way to read it is they just have you know replicated the same kind of idolatrous uh, sin. Um, but let's. So that's yes. In terms of the the the, th the flow of this history, that's he's going back and forth again, saying this is again and again. You guys just don't get it. But let's think about our Torah reading per se. Any connections there? Is this a Torah reading with Rachel and the idols? So I well those I don't know if. Um, that seems to have been a little like uh, if she wasn't worshiping the idols. It doesn't seem to be so. I don't know if it's exactly a parallel. Well, so, it, it brings it up. That's yes. That's a fair. I mean, I'm not saying it's a one to one. Okay. But it brings up the question, Rachel, as they're about to flee, their uh, uh, Lavan. So Lavan is her father, right? And Lavan has actually been pretty disgusting to her. Right? Just when, when she thought she was getting married to the person that she loved so much, she ends up getting switched with her sister. So Lavan has not exactly been um, the most uh, uh, you know, wonderful uh, parent. And they, as I said, both women you know, basically just you know, express total disgust with him. But the difference is that Leia just you know, packs up and leaves. And Rachel decides to steal Lavan's idols. There, the word there is trafim, which means like little idols, little, you know, portable idols, you know, little uh, um, household gods, household gods, or, uh, you, know, uh, you know, portable ones, things that you can carry around, you know, uh, you know, when you go to the beach, you know, if you, you know, you know, whatever. So she's, and, and that's where Jen's question actually comes back when we, if we would be you know, reading the Torah reading, we would ask, why is she doing that? Why, why does she steal um, her, her father's idols? And of course, then we have the scene later where he's infuriated and he goes, you stole my idols. And he goes through and he insists on ransacking the entire um, camp Jacob knows nothing about it. So, uh, and he says, come on, we don't have it. You're, you're, this is another one of your terrible things. Actually, this is the ironic thing where actually Lavan is telling the truth. He actually once in his life actually was accurate. Um, and then the, the deceit is not Jacob's deceit and it's not Lavan's deceit, but it's Rachel's deceit. She lies to her father, to his face. And she says, you know, she puts the idols under her saddle. She sits on the saddle and she goes, dad, I wish I could get up and, you know, and show you, you know, proper respect, but I can't. I'm, I'm uh, you know, it's that time of the, of the month for me. I'm not feeling so well. And as a result, she gets away with not uh, um, getting up for her father, number one, and also not giving away the idols. So what's, what, what, are, what is she trying to do? What's going on? What are her motivations? You know, I, I read that they have found inscriptions about presenting the family idols in order to secure an inheritance. I kind of think that like makes it a really interesting story. I think she grabbed those so that uh, she could secure the, whatever inheritance might be coming their way, although that would be why Laban is like, yeah, you can't come back this way. So he doesn't want them coming back with the family idols to take the land or whatever. So I don't know if that's the case, but it, it puts a really interesting spin on what she's doing. So it adds more of the, of the, I think, to the question. What are the issues that are at stake? Does, you know, after all, Jacob actually has succeeded beyond literally his dreams, his wildest dreams. He has a big, gigantic holding of, of animals and stuff, which he has miraculously been able to do uh, to, to, to accumulate. And like I said, Leah has no problem leaving and of course she's the firstborn so if we're talking about inheritance theoretically she might uh, um, have you know a, a, a larger claim or maybe no claim because she's after all just a woman uh, this, but, do we know if there were sons i mean you know what? there were sons there were sons, there were sons so yeah. they probably wouldn't have gotten Jacob anything. says boy you know love on sons are not looking at me the way they used to look at me they're 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 
they're not so friendly anymore. So um, they're probably not really in line for any inheritance then. Right. So, so she, they've got plenty, right? And J Jacob will say to his brother Asaph later, I've got plenty. I'm really not destitute. Uh, you know, I left home destitute, but now I'm doing fine. So, you know, what, what is the stealing? So one possibility is revenge, right? She knows how, how precious these idols are to her father. She knows how her father gets sustenance, gets strength, gets inspiration from hanging out, you know, or, or conferring with his little idols, you know, and, and uh, having a, you know, a great conversation. You know what I'm going to do to Jacob tomorrow morning? Oh, I just, you know, it's going to be so, so much fun. Thank you for helping me out. You know, so maybe she's just, she's just like digging it, you know, sticking it in to him. Um, and, and then. Yeah, with idols are like that, wouldn't you think that might make him seem like a really religious person, I, which doesn't like. I don't why, know, doesn't why, 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 why not assume that he was, uh, you know, uh, plenty of people were very that's, religious in those days. Um, yeah, that's that's true, one, of the, right. one of the things that the prophets keep on scratching their heads. Everybody's so religious and nobody's any, nobody's a decent human being. So they would, you know, that doesn't go hand in hand, unfortunately. That's what the prophets couldn't understand. Why doesn't it go hand in hand? So, yeah. Too, true. yeah, yeah. So, and then even saying that she's, you know, she's sitting down and she knows that she's sitting on the idols and she tells her father, you know, I'm, I'm just a bloody mess. I, I really can't get up now and so on. Um, Actually, we know that she was not menstruating because right after that she gave birth um, to, to Benjamin next week. But uh, um, so we know that actually she was lying through her teeth. But it's a kind of, you could imagine it being a kind of a delicious lie. Like, you know what I'm doing to your idols? I'm sitting on them and I'm just like bleeding all over them. Like, <laughs> that's, that's what I'm doing to your idols. Um, that would be one way to actually sort of imagine what's going on in her head. But you could go a different way. And maybe she's taking the idols because she really thinks that there's some kind of power in those idols. Maybe she really does buy into some kind of concept that these idols are not nothing. They're not trash. They're not something to even mistreat in a certain kind of way. But <coughs> not just in terms of you know, so socioeconomically, this is my entitlement or something, but maybe she really buys into some kind of power that the idols have and she needs them because she needs protection against her father. And later on, we'll see um, that not only, you know, yes, you know, when the Israelites uh, have the golden calf, but even Jacob's own sons have idols um that they that they are holding on to so it's not so easy to just like have a clean perfect monotheistic faith and and this is driving hoshea crazy right this is saying how you know what does it take what does it take to break you from this idol addiction you know what 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 can, what what have i not done so you know what? The fury just pours out, right? And, and the, the, the images of just enraged wild beasts. And one, one that's, that's uh, um, for me, particularly um, striking is uh, verse eight. Like a bear robbed of her young, I attack them and rip open the casing of their hearts. Wow. So those are two images that are really uh, pretty, pretty cool. Um, you know, the first thing is you want to imagine how angry God could be. And it takes this nature image, right? Can you imagine a mother bear, right? And it's not the father bear, it's the mother bear, right? And God is saying, I'm like a mother bear whose cubs have been stolen from her, have been taken away from her. And I will get you for that. Right. Um, so the the, uh, um, the the most dear, precious, and and you know um, 
biologically necessary um, entities, right? The mother needs those cubs because that's her future. That's her life. That's, that's what she's here for, to make you know, the next generation of cubs. And without those cubs, there's nothing, right? There's no future. I mean, that, that image is of somebody else coming and taking them from her. Here, right. though, it's the kids themselves, right? It's Israel itself. Right, there's a shifting back and forth, yeah. right, mm -hmm. exactly. Because if you really were my kids, you wouldn't take my kids away, right? If you really were acting like my kids, then you would be my little loving cubs that would come to me and I would take care of you and everything would, you know, would, would be, you know, perfect the way nature should be. <coughs> and instead, you have alienated yourselves, you've estranged yourself, you become this other people. And then that, uh, that second phrase is very, very, uh, um, very powerful, right? I will rip open the covering, the closing of your hearts. You are, you are so, um, what's the word? Like with anesthesia, right? You are so numb. Your heart is so encased and it doesn't feel a thing. How could you not feel what you're doing? How could you not have remorse? How could you not have, have feeling of, of, of connection or loyalty or love or dependency or anything? I, I'm going to rip open that, that, that rip away that, that, that scorely bump, the closedness, the closing you know, membrane around your heart. What's another word for that closing membrane that we have in other places? Orla. Orla is the foreskin, right? The brit mila, the circumcision that we are commanded to do in our tradition, is to take away the encasing membrane around the top of the penis. And then God says also, and take away the orla, take away the encasing membrane around your heart. Take that away. It's it's uh, the you know the connection is made very very explicit. Right? So that's that's what God is saying here. Okay, um, somebody's uh, having a good time. Good, verse nine. You were undone, O Israel. You had no help but me. Where now is your king? Let him save you. Where are the chieftains in all your towns from whom you demanded, give me a king and officers? I give you kings in my ire and take them away in my wrath. Ephraim's guilt is bound up, his sin is stored away. Pangs of childbirth assail him and the babe is not wise for this is no time to survive at the birth, at the birth stool of babes. From Shaol itself, Shaol. Oh, wait, so, so Shaol, Shaol, Shaol right? Right. Like, like hell. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we have these child bearing images, right? And God says, you, you know, you're gonna have the pain of childbirth, but you're not gonna have the result of childbirth, right? You're gonna have all of the, 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 the torture of it, but nothing will survive. Nothing will live out of all of that pain, right? There won't be any fruit of your, of your labors. Um, and again, not the most, you know, it's not a one for one, but of course, this is one of the big issues in our Torah reading, having these children or not being able to have children. And of course, next week, we will have the tragic story of uh, Rachel not surviving, her son will survive, but she will not survive this, life-threatening process it's you know it, it back and certainly in those days but even today it's it's a very uh, um you know dangerous life-threatening uh um, process to give to give life to bring out more life is actually um pretty risky okay 14 yeah i'm just puzzling over you know verses 9 and 10 um is this referring to the fact that um, that the people wanted to have a king, um, and that God hadn't really intended? So, I, so, so that's a little bit, I think, old, 
because let's, you know, he is talking about now the present. And by now, the kingship uh, institution is a given. Right. It's such a given that it's like doubled. That's the whole point of the fact that there are two kingdoms. Like we, we can't even get along on one, one king. We had, to, we had to split up and, and have two different kings, one for the south and one for the north. And then the kings themselves, like it's like a revolving door. You know, they, 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 they rule, they get murdered, they, get, they, they uh, you know, die in battle. They're, they're all miserable, crooked, uh, um, you know, uh, um, evil people. So that's, I think it's more, not so much that original choice, but I mean, it reverberates. Well, it hasn't worked out. It hasn't worked right, out. Because it's asking, been, it's been a total disaster. Yeah. Right. Instead of me, you've gotten these kings. And guess what? I just flick them away, right? You'll have a king, then you'll have another king, and have another king, and you think that's going to help you? Not going to help you. Can I ask a question? Sure. So, okay, obviously, Hosea's like words survived, right? So was he a citizen of the Northern Kingdom? And he paid his taxes. Okay, so like no, but he he and I mean because he had a driver's license. Especially if the destruction hadn't really come yet or anything. I mean, if I were like a you know an average Joe in the Northern Kingdom, this guy would sound like a rabid fanatic to me that I wasn't really going to pay. I you know. Sure, I love Hashem and I also love my little household gods. And so, you know, so what, dude? Um, so I, I would never have actually, I, I'm amazed at his words, actually, somebody took care of them enough and kept them alive because I would have dismissed this guy as a raving lunatic. Very um, important and, point, not only about Hosea, but about all the prophets. Yeah. This is the miracle. Uh, I talked a little bit about it when we, when we first, you know, started, you know, with the idea that we're going to look at the prophets. But you're right. Any sane society would have gotten rid of all of these books a long time ago, and they should not be here, right? Or maybe, you know, some archaeologist, you know, would find, <coughs> you know, some, you know, some, some, some remains, you know, out of, by digging down, you know, uh, 5,000 feet until they get to the, you know, to the layers of some place where, where somebody wrote this stuff down. The fact that the Jewish people preserved and sanctified all of this stuff, which tells us how terrible we are, is psychologically amazing and historically amazing. And um, it, it's, a, it's a tremendous, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a tremendous phenomenon that speaks to some kind of, to my mind, some kind of small, and it's because it's not a mass movement. Like you say, most people, you know, were just okay with just like getting by and, you know, being as, you know, as, as faithful or not faithful or a little bit of this and a little bit of that. There were, there had to be small groups of people from generation to generation that cherished these documents and sanctified them and said, we cannot just throw them away. And, and that speaks to some kind of almost messianic belief, right? That this will, in the end, all make sense in the future. This will all finally register. And we're going to get, well, we're not going to, maybe, maybe we'll get, um, you know what, we're going, to, we're going to read like two verses because we only have a couple of more minutes. We'll skip a little bit. <coughs> but um, that Hosea doesn't give up hope that we will um, not repent. He, he, he believes there's, there's the hope that we will repent. And Hosea doesn't live to see it. And the next hundred years didn't live to see it. And the next hundred years and the next, and here we are to this day, except that we held on to the books. That's, that's the, cra it's crazy. You're right. It's absolutely a miracle. Not just for Hosea, that, this whole literature. Um, 
you know, why, why would we, why would we preserve this? It, except for the fact that there's this like inside our hearts, whatever coverings there are inside our hearts, there's this, there's this connection. Lynn. It seems just on the surface to speak to Jewish history, the, everything is about renewal and circles. And it seems to me that this is a, uh, the fact that we've kept all these negative images of ourselves is a way of saying, you're not done. It's a constant renewal of effort and work and ritual and you know, that it's, that it's not like we're the chosen and you're done. Okay. Goodbye. It's a constant as a group and as individuals. Right. But like I say, it's a small minority of people that are holding on to this for the sake of everybody else. There's this, there's a, you know, a, a, this tiny group of the faithful that just keep it going and then keep in bringing it out and, and bringing it out and bringing it out. Let's look at just a couple of things. Let's give Jose, Hosea the last word. Um, let's read uh, 14, verse 2 and 3. Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God, for you have fallen because of your sin. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all guilt and accept what is good. Instead of bulls, we will pay the offering of our lips. Okay, so we will return. This is so. This is Hosea saying you can come back. Shuva Yisrael. This is the this part of the of the of this haftorah is repeated on the Shabbat between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yeah. This this is the the word Shuva Yisrael. This is Shabbat Shuva, and then just the idea that it's really a question of a choice. The choice is ours. Last verse of the of the haftorah. He who is wise will consider these words. He who is prudent will take note of them. For the paths of the Lord are smooth, the righteous can walk on them, while sinners stumble on them. Okay, so that's, this is, it's up to us. Here's the path. Um, we can, if with righteousness, the path is walkable. With wickedness, the path is rocky and, and, and potholes, and it doesn't make any sense. And we're just going to like stumble and fall. So in the end, it really depends on us. All right, Yeshikoach. Let's stop the recording.